just magic, but it's good to see you all this morning. I greet you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be with each and every one of you here this morning. I want to invite you to stand with me as you're able as we join together in worship in this call to worship. And we'll follow this with hymn number 42. All people that on earth do dwell in number 42. If you respond with what is bold and yellow, great is the Lord. And greatly to be praised. Let the heavens shout with joy. Let all the people celebrate God's greatness. Sing praise to God, for God is good. God said that love endures forever. Make a joyful noise to the Lord. Hallelujah. God's love will never fail. Lord, 
for we are ashamed and sorry for all we have done to displease you. Forgive our sins and help us to live in your light and walk in your ways for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Friends, believe the good news in Christ, our sins are forgiven, to which we say, Thanks be to God. I also invite you to turn to your neighbor, give you a warm welcome and pass the peace. Thank you. Thank you. This morning, it's good to see all of you here on this bright, sunny, and of course it's sunny, kind of cloudy and snowy, uh, but I'm going to choose to say it's bright and sunny. Um, I've been gone for a couple of weeks. I had the privilege of having another time of vacation, which was wonderful. I mostly sat in my apartment and played guitar, which is a delight to me. I, I do that all the days of my life and all the hours of my life. If I could, that was wonderful. Uh, and then we had Thanksgiving service on Wednesday night of this week. And then I immediately got in the car and Adam and I drove to Indianapolis and we were able to experience for the first time in quite a long time uh, my entire family being together. Everybody uh, on my side of the family. And I want to kind of highlight some of the people in this picture because this is the entire Vincent clan. This is, this is everybody uh, except for Elizabeth. Um, and you'll notice right away Vincent Jean is long hair. I mean, that's <laughs> everyone in my family's got a great head of hair. I'd trade anyone for their head of hair, except, except for uh, Tom. Um, Tom. Back, back left uh, is Christopher. He is the uh, partner for my three nephews, which are right there in a row. Selena is next to him, uh, Lance, and Vince. And Vince has got an incredible head of hair. He's just gorgeous. Uh, he's next, they're all next to their father, Tom, and he's the only one I wouldn't trade hair with. Oh, he's still got more than I do. Um, and then David is with Rita, that's Tom's sister, and then Evan, of course, is uh, Carmen's partner uh, on the far right in the back. And then up front, you have Carmen and Quinn next to each other, Quinn's partner, Henry. Um, and then Adam and Megan, you can see Quinn and Adam again sporting the hair. Uh, and then, of course, I got the, you know, I got the half shame on, uh, because I have nothing to show. Um, and then I'm next to my mom, and my mom and dad and I are color coordinated. Look at how, how our, 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 really nice. We didn't plan that. Uh, and so that's mom and dad, and then my sister Tina's on the far right. And so we got to all be together. We're there at Tina's house, and, and she took an automatic picture. If you go anywhere with Carmen, Carmen is the planner extraordinaire. Uh, she got all the planning genes in the family. And she took us to a place where you just pay however much per hour you want to know, um, to pet a bunch of cats who were up for adoption. And so it was a wonderful place. And you know, you're not supposed to pick up the cats, but if the cats come to you, then you can let them stay with you. And this cat, uh, who a little boy in the room had named Shadow Sun, and I thought that's something like that name, Shadow Sun, uh, had come up, and honestly, I came that close to adopting. <laughs> and, uh, this, this cat and I are getting along really, really well, as you can see, it just, just nestled right uh, on our lap. Uh, and then we uh, had a final meal at uh, a Mexican place, which is kind of a, a normal thing, but the, the good news behind all of that is we got to be together. Uh, all together, and that hasn't happened in a long time. So, very grateful for that time. I hope your Thanksgiving was just as joyous. I also want to thank deeply from the bottom of my heart Jim Schleif, who filled in for me two weeks ago, uh, Dean Stenlow, who filled in last week. Um, both extraordinary. I always listen in, I, I listen in through the streaming. Uh, ben did a great job with the testimony, so did Charlene, second service um, uh, last week. 
And so, you know, it's just a joy to be able to tune in while I'm away and be able to see that things are going well and to hear some great preaching and teaching and to hear some wonderful testimonies. It was really, really encouraging the whole uh, vacation. So thank you for that. Uh, Jen's going to give us the rest of the announcements. Good morning. Good morning. As Rich said, so good to see you all here today who are joining us presently physically here in the snow and certainly warm welcome to all of those who are snuggled up at home or and just enjoying the view out the window. So blessings to all. Um, just a reminder that today we are going to be doing Advent decorating after um, starting after the service and then carrying on more after the second service. So if anyone's interested in sticking around, um, I know that they would appreciate extra hands for helping with that. Um, also, next Sunday, the Indian Task Force is hosting a cookie walk, a Christmas cookie walk. So for those of you who are bakers, today is the last day to sign up for baking. For those of you who are buyers, um, make sure you come with uh, your cash and checkbooks next week. Um, it'll be set up downstairs, and um, based on the lineup we have so far, there's going to be lots of good treats there. So um, make sure you plan accordingly for that. Um, also, just a reminder that we are collecting blankets and all different kinds of things for the Circle of Friends Shop. The blankets are for the um, Circle of Friends Shop as well as Mr. Bob's under the bridge. The giving tree is for the Circle of Friends Shop. There's a list outside the main office if you want to take a look at the list. Those are the most needed items. Um, certainly, that's, we're not limiting it to that, but those are the things that we need the most at this point. Um, also, just a reminder, we got the bucket of apple boy and the drawing will be at our uh, Christmas benefit concert, which is December 9th, so make sure you mark your calendars for that too. Um, and then finally, um, Tamara, is this the last day to sign up for Feast with Friends, or is that out for a little bit yet? Yeah. Um, it'll be out for a little bit. Okay, well, don't forget, sign up for Feast with Friends, and if you have any questions, Tamara would be happy to answer those for you. And then I'm going to invite Karen up. She has a, a quick little message she'd like to give to you. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, the 2024 offering envelopes are in the narthex. You can pick them up. For those of you who uh, indicated last year that you didn't want any for next year, any offering envelopes, uh, you won't find your envelopes there. However, if you change your mind, there's a pad of paper and a pen out there that you can write your name and I'll uh, get envelopes for you. Also, anybody who um, had offering envelope numbers 151 and above, you have new numbers just because I reduced the number of envelopes that I did purchase. So um, just wanted to let you know so um, that you, you're aware that you do have a, a different number. And if you have any questions, you can, uh, I'll be around after church, and otherwise you can uh, call the church office, and I'm usually here almost every day, otherwise Tuesdays for sure I'm here. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Yeah. And I'm, I'm sure too, if you have envelopes out there and you've changed your mind to not have envelopes, um, also let Karen know that too, if you've decided to be giving online instead. Um, in regards to health updates, uh, Jay Welzine, um, Irene's husband, had a stroke and he's um, going through rehab right now, so we want to keep Jay and Irene in our prayers. And then continued prayers for Jessica Frederick, Terry Christie, Ed Newling, uh, Fred Seatbelt, and certainly Pastor Rich as he's coming down on home stretch here to his year mark for his transplant. Flowers on the altar today are from Karen Zakow in memory of her parents, William and Lorraine Mueller. So thank you for the, the flowers today, Karen. Um, Ministry of Music, we're always grateful to have Larry with us. So thank you, Larry. And Fellowship Hour Treats today are from Maggie McCann. So looking forward to those goodies. And then birthdays, today we have Howard Kusler. And then throughout the course of the week, Tracy Hafman, Karen Lewis, Dan Luter, Jim Peters, Karen Zakow, Russ Demon, Mary Ellen Dodge, Aiden Mitchell, and Peggy Kay. So please join me in singing. Happy birthday to you. All right, now I'd like to invite Chris to come forward for a first scripture reading. Good morning. Good morning. The reading today comes from Psalm 100. Verses 1 through 5. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. 
Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name, for the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness to all generations. Christ is Lord, 
to the glory of God the Father. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
It's speaking of both God's greatness and God's goodness, and that being the source from which one's thanksgiving uh, erupts and explodes. It's a beautiful prayer, and it shows us that both God is great and God is good. But I want to argue from Psalm 100 that the interesting thing about Psalm 100, and the reason I titled this message, Good is Better Than Great, is good is better than great in Psalm 100. Now, that might not make sense at first, but it will by the time this message is over. At least I hope it does. Because we're dealing with these very small words, good, great. And you all know that small words are the most difficult words. The most difficult words are not the big words, anti-disestablishmentarianism. It's one of the biggest words in the dictionary. That's not a hard word because it's very focused. It can really only mean one thing. I found another one that I love, sesquip, sesquipet, sesquipedalianism. Does anyone know what sesquipedalianism is? A hard time even saying it. it what is that? I, yeah, all I know is it's a love of big words. <laughs> so it's yeah, it's the love of big words, and you have to learn that big word to know the love of big words, I guess. Uh, but the point is, these big words are not the hard words. The hard words in our life are words like love. They can have all kinds of meaning. Truth. I mean, truth right now, we don't even agree what a fact is. We don't even agree on what really happened all kinds of, you know, options for what really is real. And it's these small words, truth, faith, hope, love, good, great, that are actually the most difficult words to process because they demand so much of us. We really got to think about what are we saying when we say God is great? What are we saying when we say God is good? And I think most of us are rather sloppy in this area, and we all are, uh, because we tend to think that perhaps they're all words that are on a spectrum, so that you begin with bad, and then there's good, and then there's better that's better than good, and of course then there's great or best, which is better than good, so that great is better than good if you make it a spectrum. And so when we say God is great, God is good, well, the priority is God is great, God is the best, and then good takes the back seat to that. Uh, we do this sloppy language in popular things like, many of you might have read the book From Good to Great. It's a very popular book about taking your business and making it from good to great. It was about this comparison of having a better business uh, culture because you've gone from good to great. Or the GOAT, G-O-A-T. When we talk about the greatest of all time, we are talking about a spectrum. We are saying that, you know, whoever you think is the greatest quarterback of all time, you can fill that name in the blank. They are the GOAT. Boat doesn't have the same zing to it. The best of all time, because that's really what it ought to be if we're talking comparison. Because great, when we speak in Scripture particularly, but really when we speak in anything, the opposite of great is not good or bad. The opposite of great is weak. Great is distinctive. It has to do with power. It has to do with sovereignty or transcendence or, or, or this immaculate uh, greatness where goodness is in a totally different realm. It has to do with benevolence or moral goodness. Now, both are important, and that's why those are both prayed in Psalm 100. God is great. God is good. And then we respond in that way. And they're both important because we know throughout our lives there are many things and people that are great but not good. And there are people who are good but not great. You can be great and not good. Supervillains, they all have great power. I mean, Thanos, Lex Luthor, you can just kind of go down the line. That they have incredible power. Politicians have incredible power. They have more power than any of us in this room. Uh, there's this sense in which you can be great, but that doesn't guarantee that you're going to be good. You can be good, but not have much power. You can be morally pure. You can always do the right thing and still end up always in the back seat, always in the lesser position because you just don't have any greatness. And the reason why greatness and goodness rarely go together is because we all know this, great power leads to abuse. 
You tend to focus on maintaining your power. You focus on achieving even more power. And greatness can go to your head. We all know that slogan that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. So that greatness tends to lead to its own corruption because your focus is on keeping that greatness. Goodness can be compromised in order to achieve greatness. You know, why be good if you can be great? Why sacrifice that greatness for moral goodness, for making sure that you do the right thing? And that's why in our song, both are celebrated together. They have to go hand in hand. God is both great and good. And you'll see this in the song that Chris read this morning. It begins with focusing on God's greatness, making joyful noise to the Lord all the earth, serve the Lord with gladness, come into his presence with singing, know that the Lord is is God. And there we're focusing on God's greatness. Know that Yahweh, when you see Lord in all capitals, that's the sacred tetragrammaton. There's another big word, Sesto Pedeli, so there you go. Uh, the Lord is God. Yahweh is God. So that when you talk about God's greatness, you are essentially saying, God is God, and I am not. There is no equal to God. Every word I say about God's greatness falls short of the actual greatness. When we're speaking about God's greatness, we're speaking about the greatness of God. There is no equal to God. So all of our words fall short, all of our thoughts fall short. Nothing we say really can express the absolute wonder and greatness of God. So that God is great, not just a little greater than us, not a difference of degrees but infinitely greater, to the point that in comparison to God's greatness, we are specks, we are wind, dust, essentially nothing. That, that, that there is absolutely no comparison. And the way that the author wants to communicate this is to say that God is creator. It is God, Yahweh, who made us. And being the creator, God has claims in our lives. God is the one, the only one, who actually, out of the infinite greatness of God, can create anything that is substantial. And the beauty is that in the midst of God's greatness, God's creating us, Israel took joy in this. He made us, and this sovereign power, this absolute greatness, not only made us, but holds us in God's sovereignty. We are God's. We are His. We are His people and the sheep of His pasture, so that in spite of God's greatness, there is this closeness and this intimacy and this tenderness of calling people into the divine embrace and allowing them to know the comfort of knowing the one who has created them also holds them day by day in the divine arms. And it's because of that that our psalm begins the way it does. Make a joyful noise, serve with gladness, come with singing, come with this sense of not a civilized restraint of an opera where you have to be quiet and make sure that you, you know, you are just quiet in the presence of greatness. But instead, it is the explosion of an arena. It is the explosion of, uh, of a crowd that is absolutely so happy to be in the presence of one that is so great, and yet in the midst of that greatness, there's this tender care and concern for all that are expressing joy and delight. That's why I think it's always important that we remember, you know, silence and quiet can be a place from which worship comes. And many times we need to be more silent and we need to be more quiet. But sometimes we ought to just be uproarious. We ought to smile and laugh and be glad and make a joyful noise and know that that's worship as well. Worship isn't just constrained to being this quiet, quiet, meek expression. It is this explosion of praise like you're going to hear in the football stadiums as the quarterbacks come out. And they're like, whoa, they're in the greatest, or at least we hope he'll be the greatest one day. And you have this, this wonder and this joy that brings a skip to the step, much like Larry's songs to me. There's this, you know, this play that makes me think, okay, all right, but we don't, we don't have to just be quiet and still. We can just join in. And the beauty of music is you can do both. You can have that beautiful silence and reflective, meditative kind of worship. You can also have this explosion of praise. So we begin the song with the emphasis that God is great. The Lord is God. Yahweh is God. But that's not where the psalm ends because good is better than great. 
At the end of the day, the psalm then turns tail and says, Enter God's gates with thanksgiving, God's courts with praise. Give thanks. Why? Why do this? Now, we all sang Psalm 42. And I won't have you turn to it, but if you have your hymnal, you'll notice Psalm 42 underneath the title. It says, The Old 100. And every musician knows Psalm 100 as the Old 100. And there are numerous hymns that are based on Psalm 100. And the verse that is the final verse, and basically if you look at the lyrics to this psalm, it is essentially a psalm, for the, psalm 100 put to music. It ends with this, verse 4. Why do we praise God? For why? Why do we praise? Why do we give thanks? Why do we do this? For why the Lord our God is good. His mercy is forever true. And you move on. His truth at all times will endure forever. So that you have this focus at the end of the psalm, not just on God's greatness, but on something that's better than greatness, and that is that the Lord is good. And the reason why we focus on this at the end is greatness is not to our advantage if there's not goodness behind it. Because as we've said, you can be great, but not good. It's very possible. You can be good, but not great. Mother Teresa was good. But she didn't have a lot of power. Uh, Mary, the mother of Christ Jesus, she was the weakest and the lowliest. Nobody knew her. People would ignore her. And yet she was immaculately good. You could be not great and not good and yet proclaim that you're both. The great and powerful Oz made it very clear that he's both great and good. But we all know he was a charlatan. He was fake. He was an imposter. He was a fraud. He was neither great nor good. Because what matters in the end is good. You have to be good in order for that greatness to be something that is worth celebrating. And the beautiful thing about Yahweh, and particularly Yahweh revealed in Christ Jesus, is that Yahweh is both great and good. Because Yahweh is sovereign with absolute power. And that absolute power does not corrupt. Because all Yahweh's power is expressed, verse 5, as the psalm closes, in steadfast love that endures forever. A love that will not end, that will not relinquish itself, that will not turn tail on the beloved, that won't look at creation and say, well, I'm sick of creation. Instead, God loves all that God has created too much to lose any of it. And so you have this incredible goodness that's connected to this sovereign greatness. And of course, we see it so clearly in Christ Jesus. That's why I read Philippians 2 for us this morning. That he wasn't puffed up with conceit. He wasn't concerned about his own welfare. He took the lowest place, the place of the servant, and even lower, the place of the criminal, even death on the cross. And it is in taking that lowest place, you don't see any greatness in regard to power you see absolute weakness and vulnerability and brokenness and the willingness to do that. And we're told that because of that, God exalted him and lifted him to the highest place because the goodness is the greatness. It is the goodness of our Lord Jesus Christ that really shows the greatness. It's not greatness without goodness. That can be despicable. It is the goodness that is great. And that's what we celebrate on Christ the Lord Sunday. We celebrate that the Lord our God is good. God's steadfast love endures forever. That God's greatness is God's goodness. And here's where we let the rubber meet the road this morning. I think the real challenge in living the Christian life, in moving forward as a believer, is not believing that God is great. Everyone who wants to talk about God assumes that we're speaking of the ultimate being of earth. Speaking of absolute power, it's easy to kind of voice, you know, God is great. It's much more challenging to believe that God is good. It's easy to think, well, God has absolute power, but does God care for me? Does God care for this world? Does God care for the weak and the downtrodden and the impoverished and, and indeed even the sinner? Does God care at all? And I think the real stretch for us is not saying God is great. When we just simply say the word God, we're assuming absolute power. It's kind of assumed. But what is not assumed is that God is good. 
So the temptation we always have is to think God is great, but maybe God's not good. God is great, and maybe God's good to others, but perhaps God's goodness is not expressed toward me. Or, or God is great and God is good in the scriptures, but maybe not here in these modern times. And that's where we come back to this reflection. The Lord is good. And the love of God, which is steadfast, endures forever. And this extends to all generations. It just keeps going and going and going. It will not fail, even in spite of sin and, and unbelief and immorality and all the things that we have to wrestle with. God's love continues. And that's why I titled this good is better than great. We have to keep God's goodness in mind. And we need to particularly keep it in mind as we want to respond to the fact that God is great and God is good. Because let's face it, what do we want to be? When we think about what we want to do in our lives and what we want to be and how we want to be remembered and the things we want to accomplish, we generally think of the categories not of good, but of great. I want to be great. Um, you think of the apostles, the question they have for Jesus. Who's the greatest, Jesus? Oh my gosh, can you imagine asking that around Jesus? Who's the greatest? We're concerned about this, Jesus. The most important thing on our minds after we've seen your healings and your mercy, your compassion to the sinner and the outsider, the real thing we're concerned about is not emulating your goodness and showing that same kind of inclusive welcome and love to others. We're more concerned about this. Which one of us is the greatest? Please tell us who's the greatest. But what good is great without good? What good is it to be at the top of the heap if you sacrifice your goodness to get there? What good is it to have great power if there's not goodness that is the true source of that power? We tend to do this when we think about God. We tend to focus on God's greatness and forget that the real reason we respond with gratitude and the real reason that we seek to live our lives is not only is God great, but God is good. And you see this in some of the definitions that we give about God. Some of our dogmas, some of our doctrinal statements, they'll start with language like this on defining who God is or what God is like. And this is a representative example from the Catholic tradition. God is almighty, eternal, beyond measure, incomprehensible, and infinite in intellect, will, and every perfection. So God is powerful. I mean, really, really powerful. Nothing compares to God's power. You notice what's absent in this. What's absent is how God defines God's self. Because when God gets the opportunity to define God's self, in Exodus 33, Moses says, Lord, show me your glory. And God says, I'll show you my glory, I'll hide you in the cleft of the rock, and I'll tell you who I am and what I'm like. And God says to Moses, I am Yahweh, the Lord, merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for the thousandth generation, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. Do you notice the absence of greatness there? Do you notice the complete and utter absence of saying, I'm infinite in power, and don't you forget it. I have all sovereignty. Bow. And I think that's sometimes how we think of God. And instead, God's greatness is revealed here in God's goodness. And God says, this is what I like, gracious and merciful and slow to anger. There's nothing about greatness in regard to power here. The power is in the goodness that God shows. And that's why I call this good is better than great. Because we are called in the end not to reflect God's good greatness, but God's goodness. We're not called to be great. You, you'll never read that in Scripture. You'll never see that as, here's what's supposed to be. We're supposed to be dominant and in power and have the final say. And everyone should bow before what we think should be done and we should be the ones writing at the top and we should be the ones that, that everyone has to give assent to because we are the greatest. You never see greatness as something that we're called to emulate, but you certainly see goodness as something we're called to emulate. So that in Psalm 100, we worship God for God alone is great, but we thank God 
because God is good. And we honor God by reflecting God's goodness, which is God's greatness. God's mercy, God's grace, God's patience and love and forgiveness. And that's why that prayer is so good. It says things in the right order. God is great, but even more importantly, God is good. And now let us live in light of that goodness, celebrate that goodness, know that goodness, and reflect that goodness in all we do, for it is that goodness which is the greatness of God manifest among us. Give just a moment for reflection, and then we'll have a response to prayer. Be with that family, we pray in this difficult time. 
Be with Jessica as she seeks treatment. Pennsylvania, be with Terry, Christy. Uh, be with Jay, Wellesley, as he recovers from the stroke. We pray for his healing and his restoration and renewal. Be with Irene and the entire family. And then we pray for those that haven't been mentioned, people who are close to us, our colleagues, our family, friends, those who stand in need of your gracious touch. We lift them into your presence and we ask that you, O oh Lord, would touch them with your healing hand and with your everlasting love. Finally, we thank you for the gifts given in the giving church and pray that you bless both the gift and the giver. As together we pray boldly with all the saints what you, our risen Lord, have taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And amen. Thank you for joining me in those words. We'll close our service with hymn number 46, God of our life. I invite you to stand if you're able.